Okay, good morning everybody. Great to see you all here this morning. Welcome to the final breakfast session for 2017. It's been a great year and for those of you who've been to multiple events, great to see you. For those here for the first time, welcome and you're now on my mailing list so you'll be hearing from me again. Uh, yeah, as I say, this is the final one for this year and we're going to go again next year so please keep an eye on the staff announcements and your emails which I'll be spamming you with from January onwards. So on to today. We're really, really lucky to be welcoming Professor Tony Bates. Tony needs no introduction and he has, although I'm going to give him a mild one now, he has broken the record for registrations for this session. So well done, Tony. And he's speaking to us from Vancouver, I believe. So before I hand over to Tony, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on traditional lands of the Ghana people and we pay our respects to elders, elders both past and present. So without further ado, over to Tony and uh, he's going to speak to us on 21st century learning. So thanks very much, Tony. Uh, also, if you have any questions and you're online, uh, post them uh, in, the, in the chat window there and we'll, we'll get to them in, in order towards the end of the session. Okay, over to you, Tony. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure I wish I could be there in person in beautiful Adelaide, um, but uh, I'm very, I'm very impressed that there are people turning up for 8 a.m. meetings uh, on campus. Um, I'm not a morning person myself. I would probably be late for this meeting if it was 8 a.m. in Vancouver. So thank you very much for making the effort to come. Uh, one, the topic is 21st century knowledge and digital learning, and. I'm not taking a, a more. I'm not taking a very traditional approach here to the uh, to the online learning uh, market. I, I'm looking at really something much broader than just online learning, and that is what kind of knowledge and skills will students need in in a in a digital age, basically. And my argument's very simple: that we need to redesign our teaching in order to meet those needs. That they're not going to be well meet, met by the traditional lecture and discussion uh, teaching methods, uh, which have served us very well in the past, but uh, not so suitable, I believe, for the challenges that our students are going to face uh, in the rest of the 21st century. And I've lost the button for changing. Where is it gone? Ah, thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk first of all about the key forces of change and then some current trends that's happening, uh, what the implications are for teaching and learning, and then some conclusions and I hope a good discussion. Because really what I'm trying to give is a glimpse of the future and that's a very dangerous um, occupation because we really don't know how that future is going to roll out. All I can do is to offer you some of the opportunities here um, for you if you want to take them. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to talk about the changing workforce and the new work and new skills and knowledge. I'm going to be talking about how our students, certainly in North America, and again, I have to preface this by saying I'm coming actually not even from a North American perspective, but more a Canadian perspective. But in Canada, we're seeing our students are increasingly diverse, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, as a result, because of the diversity of students, the need for more personalized or individualized learning that is adaptable to the different needs of students. I'm going to be talking about new modes of delivery, uh, blended online, open education resources, and massive open online courses and some new technologies, video and social media, and how all that kind of goes into some big kind of stew, and then we have to kind of work out what kind of, um, what we're going to do with that stew of all those factors. <clears throat> Let's start with the key forces of change, and particularly the demands of a digital economy. Now, what we're seeing in Canada, which we're very similar in some ways to Australia, we have a huge resource-based um, agricultural and natural resources, mining, oil, energy, and so on. 
Well, one of the interesting things that's happening in, in, in that industry is how much of that is now becoming knowledge-based in the sense of IT-based, uh, uh, becoming much more uh, automated and uh, uh, very much uh, driven by digital technologies. And we see that happening in other industries. In Vancouver here, we have a very thriving uh, media and entertainment industry. Many of the movies you see in Australia are made here in, in Vancouver. Um, although they meant to look like San Francisco or Los Angeles, they're actually made here in Vancouver. One clue is to look out for the mountains in the background. They don't have snow-capped mountains in San Francisco. Um, and in obviously in other areas like retail and financial and services and health, they're all becoming much more knowledge-based component and that's growing and growing. So it doesn't really matter what kind of industry you're in, uh, the, the knowledge base component is becoming high. And that means that a lot of the low skilled, um, low, quite well paid, but automated jobs are now being automated. And the, 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 the real jobs, the ones that pay money are much more knowledge based and involve things like management, uh, use of computing technologies, media production and so on. Uh, next slide, please. What are the kind of skills that students are going to need to, to work in these areas? And some of these we've always taught in universities, but some, um, but often they've not been explicitly taught or we've not actually focused uh, specifically on teaching those skills. We assume that students will pick them up very often. Uh, these are th skills like communication skills and not just communicating in writing, but uh, in, in other formats um, such as YouTube videos, social media and so on. Independent learning skills, the ability to go on learning after you've graduated, increasingly important in knowledge based industries where the knowledge base is continually changing. Ethics and responsibility, of course, teamwork and flexibility. The, the, the graphic here is deliberately chosen. This is a small design company, it makes a very specific component for Volkswagen Motors. It was a company that was set up by these three guys. Um, it's a very niche kind of company and they do everything. They do the marketing, they do the um, uh, research, they do the development and then they contract out the manufacturing. And it's, it's typical of a 21st century small startup company where uh, they have to work, uh, work together, they have to be very flexible in how they work and so on. Then there are the skills that we've always taught in universities, critical thinking, problem solving and creativity. But again, these have to be embedded and rather more specific within different subject disciplines. Uh, I say that because critical thinking, these skills don't generalize to a, to, to a certain extent. So for instance, uh, problem solving in business is not the same as problem solving in medicine for two reasons. One is that the knowledge base is different. The knowledge you need to know to solve problems is different, obviously. But also the approach to problem solving is different as well. For instance, in business, they're more risk tolerant. In fact, if they're not risk tolerant, they're not probably going to be successful in business. Whereas in um, medicine, they're risk averse for obvious reasons. So again, it's not so much a gener generic skill that students will pick up anyway through going to university, but something more embedded within the subject discipline. And then, of course, skills like creativity and imagination and so on, which are, if you, particularly if you're working in the media industry, are particularly important. And another set of skills are information technology skills embedded in a subject area. And again, these are not, I'm all for teaching coding and so on, but these are not generic skills. There are um, knowing what kind of information technology, what kind of software, will be valuable within your subject discipline for all kinds of reasons. It could be for research, it could be because that's what you're going to use when you go out in, in, into the workforce and so on. But it's getting your students used to looking for and analyzing and applying the IT, the, the technology that they need within their jobs. And lastly, and I call this an overriding skill, um, the skill of knowledge management. Um, that is the ability to find, analyze, 
uh, evaluate uh, and apply information appropriately in whatever you're doing. And now this is a more generic skill and it, I think it applies to all subject areas these days. Um, and again, we need to teach that specifically rather than hope students will pick it up. And I'll come back to how we do that uh, a little later in the presentation. Okay, third one is changing students. Uh, the diversity of students now compared with say 40 or 50 years ago is quite outstanding and is, 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 is quite uh, enormous because about 30, 40 years ago, we were getting very students from a very uh, homogenous type of background, uh, usually middle class or upper, upper class in the UK, um, high levels of education, very small numbers, uh, all very, roughly at the same level of abilities or you know, a range of abilities, but not a hugely wide range of abilities. Now we, we're getting students with different language backgrounds, different motivation, um, a lot, a lot of a lot, a lot of students are working part time. Some are only working a little bit part time. Others are working nearly all uh, the time and putting managing their studies on on top. And the other thing we're finding, particularly with interdisciplinary studies, um, is that students come with different knowledge bases. So that some students know a lot about some things, but very little about others. And that's not homogenous again amongst all the students. So how do we deal with that complexity, that um, variation in individual students? And then we have students with different levels of comfort in using technology. I don't like the term digital natives. Uh, I think that applies a generation uh, homogeneity that I, I haven't found with students. I find students vary enormously in, in their technology competency but it's often much higher than, than mine is for, for sure and for a lot of professors. Um, then there's need for a much wider variety of recognized qualifications. Um, once you've graduated, do you want to come back and do another degree or would you rather just get a small credential that can be carried over perhaps and build, up, build on into a master's later on but we need different kinds of qualifications now that might meet diverse le learning needs. And again, the increasing importance of lifelong learning, the ability to go on learning throughout your life is becoming critically important, especially in the knowledge based industries. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And so what we're seeing is a need for more personal learning, the need to provide teaching and learning in ways that allow for the diversity of students. And that means different approaches and different routes for different students. But how to do that? We're not seeing class sizes going, getting smaller, certainly not in Canada. Uh, if anything, they're going up. So how do you manage to provide that diversity when often you've got 100 to 200 students in your class? Well, it, 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 there's two ways to do that, and, or a com combination of ways. And that's through better design of learning, um, designing the learning so that you can manage those differences better and the application of technology, which allows students to differentiate in how they learn. They can have more ch choices, more options in terms of what media they use for learning. Uh, they, we, they can get more, more or less practice depending on, on their background, whether they need to practice a lot more on something and so on. So we have to look at two aspects, not just the technology, but also the design of learning to accommodate that variation in student differences. Because if we don't accommodate that variation, we get a lot of students dropping out and failing. Yeah, sorry, yes, next slide, please. And the fifth, um, the fifth force of change, which is the new modes of delivery. Um, we've got a continuum now from use of no technology for delivering uh, teaching right through to fully online, all technology. But the interesting area for me, we have pretty good models for all face-to-face -face and we have pretty good models for fully online, but now we're seeing this blended model growing and growing. And that ranges from just adding PowerPoint slides to your lectures, which is classroom aids, certainly better than those smudgy overhead um, transparencies, ink transparencies that we used to write on but still not really changing much in the classroom other than having better, better 
uh, visuals for, for your teaching into things like flipped classrooms where the lecture is recorded and put on video, the students watch the video and then come into class for discussion. And what I call hybrid learning, which we're beginning to see growing quite rapidly now on campus in Canada, and that is where a deliberate redesign of the teaching to combine the best aspects of face-to-face -face teaching with the best aspects of online learning. Um, and we don't have good models for that at the moment. We're ex still experimenting with that. But it, in many ways, this is going to be the future of campus-based teaching. It's going to be this mix uh, of hybrid and a mix of online and face-to-face and, and -face learning. Now, these are all challenges for faculty. Um, it, they're, they're enormous challenges for faculty. Um, not just any one of these will be a big challenge, but they're all arriving more or less in, in parallel. So next slide, please. So here's a chance for you to get your typing skills going. I'm going to ask you, can you go back one, please? Can we, I'm going to ask you some questions here and I'd like to see what your answers are. First of all, do you have that feeling that the world is changing around you as a university teacher? And if so, is that having any direct effect on your teaching? And if so, how, how, how is that happening? And second question for you, uh, does a greater focus on skills and learning outcomes undermine or reinforce the academic endeavor? If we implicitly we're putting, if you're following my argument, it means putting more focus on developing skills and less on delivery of content. Uh, I'll come back to that issue in a moment. Does that reinforce or undermine the academic endeavor? And the third question, is the diversity of students a challenge for your teaching? Or is this something that you, you're not really having to deal with? And I hope, hope to see some comments coming up. Um, but while you're typing those in, I'll just make a reference to that diagram this is called the VUCA diagram, that the future is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And we're on the shore here, that yellow bit at the bottom, and we have to work out how we're going to get our students to that future state. And that means a fair bit of um, improvisation and imagination rather than following uh, strict rules that we've adopted from the past. Okay, continue to type up those answers. I'll come back to them in a minute. And then while you're doing that, I'll move on to the next slide. So Perhaps what are some we'll of the trends? We'll get the people in the room to respond to that question towards the end of the... Uh, oh, yes, sorry, yes. Thanks, I'm used Tom. to everybody being fully distant. Yeah. If you're online, please go ahead. Okay, I've got a couple of comments here. Uh, University is just making more learning for students more complicated rather than addressing the complexity of learning in a digital age. I'm not sure, Arena, what you mean by making it more complicated, but uh, um, maybe you could expand on that a little bit in another note. Amelia agrees with me. I'm looking for people who don't actually, but thank you, Amelia, for agreeing. Um, but yes, you're feeling the pressure of not, not being fully competent. I understand that too. I, I tried to retire a couple of years ago because I just couldn't keep up with the technology. It was a full-time job. Okay, let's look, look at some of the trends that are happening. The first figure is from the United States where they've been tracking. These are for four credit online learning courses. These are courses leading to degrees or diplomas in um, in the United States. And you'll see there's been a steady increase in enrollment. They've gone up from something like 5 to 10% to 30% of students taking at least one online course. We have in the next slide. And we just done a survey. Can you go back one, please? We've just done the first survey of online learning in Canada. We surveyed all 203 public universities and two-year college, public two-year colleges in Canada. 
Uh, we had a 69% response rate of the, covering 78% of all student enrollments. We had a better response rate from the bigger white institutions than the smaller ones. Uh, this was a voluntary survey. The, uh, it wasn't a government required one, so we were we still nevertheless got a very high response rate. Uh, next slide, please. What we found is that 98% of all Canadian universities and 94% of the colleges outside Quebec offer fully online courses. So almost every university in Canada now has some kind of online courses for credit. Um, and the growth in the last five years has been quite rapid. Um, these are fully online courses, not blended courses. Um, the growth has been 10% per year in universities over the last five years. So almost a 50% increase overall in five years. And we estimated we need a bit more uh, research, a couple of more surveys each year to really nail this figure down. But we reckon that, that about 16% of all the course enrollments now uh, for, for degree programs in universities are taken online. Now, that doesn't mean to say that 16% of students are doing fully online courses. It means that uh, in many areas, students are just picking up one online course, sometimes in order to complete their degree. They've just short of, say, three credits, and uh, they need an extra, fit in an extra course to get their degree finished without having to come back for another year. But increasingly, a lot of them are students taking master's programs uh, fully online uh, in professional areas. So, so it, it, it's, it's gone up from about 5% to 16% over the last 10 years. So although it's never going to replace campus-based teaching, it's now a significant proportion. And more importantly, it's having an impact as more professors get experience in teaching online, it's in, impacting on their classroom teaching as well. And incidentally, the course completion rates for these online courses are pretty good. They're about 5% below those for the face-to-face -face, uh, students, which is not surprising when you think that one reason many of these students are taking online courses is because they're working part-time and ha you know, ha have a job fitting in all, all their classes. Uh, next slide, thank you. And the other big development is hybrid learning. And we define that as some reduction in face-to-face -face teaching um, taken up by more time for students to study online. And again, I, we were surprised at how many institutions offer at least some hybrid learning. About 75% uh, offer some hybrid learning. But there aren't many courses like this. Most had less than 10% of their courses were hybrid. Although we, there were three or 13 institutions, about 3%, who had 30% or more of their classes that were hybrid. Um, and one of the responses from the institutions is that they felt that hybrid was leading to more innovative teaching and a better use of limited spaces. That were two reasons why they felt hybrid learning was beginning to take off. Uh, next slide, please. So there's been a big move the last two years to hybrid learning. Some institutions estimate that by in three or four years' time, about 50% of all their classes will be some kind of hybrid class where they won't be teaching as many classroom sessions as previously, um, some of it replaced by online learning. Most of it at the moment is flipped teaching, but it's clear that it can be so much more. And we've seen some signs of quite innovative uses of a combination of face-to-face -face and online. But it raises a very critical question here, and that is, if you're an instructor, what's the best use of your face-to-face -face time? What's the right mix? And I'll be honest here, we don't have very good research or theory to help answer those questions. Many of the things that we thought could not be done face-to-face -face have been very successfully done in fully online courses. We have things like, for instance, remote labs and simulations in lab-based teaching, um, although it's still expensive and there's a long way to go on that. So the question it might be is, is it best in, say, um, STEM subjects to deal with the theory online 
and reserve the on-campus teaching for, for, for the hands-on stuff in the labs and so on. Um, that might, it's an easier decision perhaps than in teaching literature, what's best done in class and what's best done online if you're teaching English literature. So again, I think it's going to be a subject by subject, topic by topic decision, but we don't have good theory or good practice to enable instructors to make those decisions. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that really struck us from the Canadian survey was that over two thirds of the institutions rated online learning as very important for their future, very important or extremely important. And most have a plan or are developing a plan or a strategy for online learning. So again, it, it's being taken increasingly seriously uh, as, as, as a key um, strategic development for universities in the future in Canada. Uh, next one, please. Another trend is MOOCs. Um, I have to say that this, this is not a trend I'm particularly interested in. Two kinds of MOOCs. There's the connectivist type MOOCs, um, communities of practice, I call them. And then there's the Coursera and edX type MOOCs from Stanford and MIT, which are mainly lecture capture um, and really more content presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the MOOCs have been driven primarily by the prestigious universities, Stanford, Harvard, and MIT. One reason for this is they've been very slow getting into online learning for credit. And I think it was an attempt by them to rebrand online learning in their own image. Um, I won't go into that discussion too much now, but um, there have been attempts at giving students credit for taking MOOCs, but assessment remains a massive challenge. I believe they're very useful for non-credit continuing education, but they really haven't taken off in Canada, even though they were invented here. Um, uh, less than 20% of the institutions are offering MOOCs, and not many, less than a third, think they'll offer MOOCs in the future. Uh, I think what those who are offering MOOCs, though, are doing them in an interesting way. They found a niche market that enables them to promote the strength of their institution to a much wider public. For instance, uh, one university in the Maritimes has a MOOC on Aboriginal knowledge um, taught by Aboriginal elders uh, as part of the truth and reconciliation process in Canada, which I think is an excellent use of a MOOC to get a better understanding of Aboriginal culture out to the general population. Um, so there are niches for MOOCs, uh, and I think it's not something I would dismiss, but they're not going to be the radical threat to uh, higher education that some Americans have made them out to be. Uh, next, next topic, next slide. However, this is, I think, the game changer, and that is op the open educational movement um, and how that's affecting campus-based, traditional campus-based universities. Now, what do I mean by open education? Well, the simplest is open textbooks, free online textbooks that students can download. Uh, we have a very good open textbook project here in British Columbia. Virtually every, I think not virtually, every first and second year university and college course now has an open textbook. Um, it saves students on average about $1,000 a year. The open textbooks are peer reviewed locally by British Columbia professors, um, top professors in their area. <clears throat> and we are seeing about 30% of the institutions are, are now using open textbooks in British Columbia. <clears throat> open research, that's research that's published in open access journals. Certainly in Canada and the UK, you know, if you have government funded research, you must publish that in an open research journal. We have open education resources, free resources that you can download. And all these developments means that Basically, all content will be free, abundant, and online. You'll be able to get virtually all knowledge that's available, it, certainly, if not now, within a few years, 
it's going to be available over the internet. Um, and that raises a big question then. Um, where does that leave you as a professor if students can go elsewhere? Let me give you one example of this. This is my grandson, actually, who's just started, or is it coming to the end of his first year at um, British University, who's taken physics first year, a very traditional course. And when I went to see him at home, he was online. I thought he was playing games. And I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm, I'm doing problems, doing problems for my physics course. And I said, oh, I, is, is this an online course? He says, no, no, it's a very traditional course. But the, the, the textbook comes with all these exercises and activities. So I said, well, how much time are you spending on this? He said, well, at least about a third of the time I'm studying. Now, this professor doesn't even know these students are studying online, but they're spending a lot of time. The other thing he says is I, he gets a lot of his materials from MOOCs. He, he goes, gets the topic in the classroom, but he says, my teacher isn't very good. So if I don't really understand it, I go to the MIT Open Courseware site and download their lectures um, and I can look at those at any time and stop and start them and it really helps. So open resources are going to actually be a big game changer and if that's the case then teaching and learner support becomes a key quality differentiator. If the students can get good quality content from anywhere, um, if they can get it but they don't always do get it, then what is the role of the professor and the instructor here? The professor and the instructor becomes much more of a guide and um, help students to evaluate the quality in the materials they're getting to, um, and much more a, a, a supporter of how they learn rather than a content deliverer. And a lot of post-secondary education at the moment is content delivery rather than skills development. So I think this will be a real game changer. Um, once um, really good quality materials are open and easily accessible, as they will be in the future. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned a little bit about open publishing, the BC Campus Open Textbook Project. Um, saved $2 million so far for population and maybe eight, eight, 70, 80,000. 80, um, I've got an open online textbook. It's had 50,000 downloads and been translated in 11 languages. Now I've lit, written other commercial books and I don't think I sold more than 10,000 of the most popular book over about eight, nine years. Whereas I got 50,000 downloads in a year and a half of my open online textbook. And again, it's been volunteers have translated this into 11 different languages. So as an academic, if I want to have an influence, um, I'm getting really interested in open publishing because it will get to a lot more people than uh, the traditional high-priced uh, book publishing industry. All right, next slide, please. And the last development in trends is the increasing move to multimedia. And again, this is quite important in terms of the kind of knowledge that we want to teach. Print and talk have historically been dominant for very good reasons in academia. Um, print deals very well with abstractions, generalizations. Uh, it's a linear form of learning. Um, it's sequential. Um, and it handles a great, well, it, it's not only handles academic materials, but it's actually led to the development of academic materials. But now knowledge can be represented in many different media text, audio, video, computing, and virtual reality. And there are some epistemological questions here about the nature of learning when it moves into different media. Is it the same? If you teach the concept of heat through video, um, exploiting the qualities of video, um, is it, is, are you learning exactly the same as, as if you were learning in an abstract print-based way, for instance? Um, but I think more importantly, the research shows that students learn better if they see things in through different uh, multiple representations of knowledge. If they can see things presented through video, uh, through text and through audio, they seem to learn better than if they get it presented just through one medium. So again, we have a wide range of media available. 
one of the importance of multimedia is 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 the ability to stop, start, and repeat. I, I, I mentioned my son going, my grandson going to MIT to use open courseware. The main advantage is he can stop, start, and repeat it as many times as he wants. This allows learners to work at their own pace. So we come back to that. How do we individualize things? Well, technology is one way to do that. The other thing about, particularly about multimedia, it facilitates the move from the concrete to abstract and reverse. A lot of higher education is about taking concrete or real things and looking for generalized principles and abstracting from that. Um, and we have students need to, to learn how to abstract and so on. But also they need to know how to apply what they've learned to new contexts and new situations. And multimedia are very good for doing that. For instance, the video can provide the concrete and the soundtrack provides the analysis or the abstraction or the application of the concrete to the theoretical knowledge. And again, this is another way to meet individual preferences for learning. Next slide, please. So again, some more questions. I, and while you're typing these questions up, I'll go back and comment on some of the responses to my previous set of questions. First of all, do you see these, these, these five trends I've gone through as significant or just passing fancies? Or which ones do you think are just passing fancies and which ones do you think are significant? Have you adopted any of these trends in your teaching? And how have you adopted multimedia, for instance, or have you adopted open courseware? And what teaching issues could one or more of these trends address? What are the problems you've actually got now that some of these trends potentially have the ability to address? And while you're doing that, let me go back to some of your comments. Um, uh, Rowena Harper said students often arrive with skills in digital consumption and digital production in social media, but they're lacking in digital skills relevant to university learning, word processing, Excel, reading and thinking critically about extended text. That's a very good point, Rowena. Again, it comes back to the importance of embedding skills in the context in which they need, need to be used. Um, I'm looking for some more comments. Uh, Irina White totally agree about open research. The rise of predatory commercial publishers is frightening. Yes, but I still think there is a role for commercial textbooks here. I, 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 now, where that role is, I don't know. But it, the problem with open textbooks, if they don't come with all those backup resources that commercial textbooks have, they're of less value to instructors and students. Um, it's not so much the commercial textbook that's valuable now, it's all that backup resource they provide, such as assessment questions, um, uh, test, test, test examples, and so on. So we, we've got to provide the open um, education resource equivalent of all that if we're gonna make open textbooks successful. Will the loss of net neutrality make access to these OERs dependent on those who ISPs favor? Absolutely. Um, this is a big threat to open and online learning. And in fact, net neutrality is legally protected in Canada. So we're gonna be in a very strange situation where um, the things will be throttled going through the US, but they won't be throttled going through Canada. Unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of the open, educational materials will be uh, coming from the US. And if there's no revenue source attached to those, they're likely to be less easily accessible without net neutrality. Okay, I'm gonna go on to a little bit more because of time constraints. Can I have the next slide? Imp, imp, can we go back one? I like this slide, implications for teaching and learning. Um, an empty classroom. One of the um, pockets of innovation I did, I've been going around Canada looking at innovative uses of technology in universities. And one was a very simple one in, in Quebec where they have absolutely brutal winters, um, snow and minus 20 and so on. 
um, a business professor found that his class of, a, of, of 100 at the start of the, uh, in, in September, by the time he got to December, was down to about 20 students. And often when the weather got better, he didn't get all those students back. Some of them had just dropped out because they missed the lectures and so on. So what he did, he just put a webcam in front of the class and told the students, you've got the choice. You can come into class or you can watch it through the webcam. Um, it will be recorded. And again, he saw his class go down from 100 to 20. But in the spring session, the numbers picked up a little bit. But he didn't lose the students who didn't come to class. He, he got a much higher completion rate for his course at the end as a result. So uh, it's just a very simple example of how technology can have major implications for teaching and learning. Next slide, please. Well, we go back to this continuum of uh, technology use from face-to-face -to, -face to fully online. So the first question for every instructor is, where should I be on this continuum? Can we have the next slide, please? Um, well, in a sense, it's not your decision. <laughs> in a sense, it should be driven by the needs of the students because different students have different needs. This comes back to the uh, diversity of students. Some students who are coming out of high school don't want to do online courses. They, they've come to the campus for all kinds of reasons other than just straight academic or um, knowledge-based reasons. And other students don't want to come on campus at all. Um, they've graduated, they've got families, but they need to uh, requalify or update their knowledge, and they're happy to be fully online. And you have high school leavers, um, or you have uh, um, part-time part undergraduates who would like a blended model and so on. So you've got different students with different needs. Now, ideally, could we have multiple modes for the same course? Could we have a course that students could take in any of these modes? And I think, actually, if you have a fully online course, it's very easy to move into those other modes. It's much harder if you have just a face-to-face -face course to start to move into the other modes. But um, I, I think it's an interesting question. And could we design our courses so that students make the choice about how the, they have the delivery, as, as the professor in Quebec did? Next slide, please. The second is this differentiation I make between content and skills. And I don't want to overemphasize this because skills depend on a knowledge base. They depend on facts, ideas, and principles. You have to know things in order to be able to do them. Um, but we've spent a lot of time in universities testing what content, what, what content or what students know rather than really focusing on, under, on skills such as understanding, analyzing, evaluating, and applying. It's a challenge for every instructor to say, what is there in your teaching that you can identify directly as leading to the development of these skills? So first of all is identifying what kind of practices you as a teacher and students as learners uh, have to adopt in order to develop a skill. And I want to make a diff distinction here between skills and competencies. There's a lot about competency-based learning, which is Basically, learning just enough to do a job, 100% mastery of the subject. I don't see skills as that. If, if I look at a soccer player like Lionel Messi, he, he's not competent. He, he, he can't just do what the other players can do very effectively. He, he's brilliant. He goes beyond that. He's learning all the time. And that's true for intellectual skills as well. There is no limit to a skill. The more you practice it, the better you get. Um, and we need to actually design that into our teaching. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So while both are necessary today, um, I, I think we've given, we need to give more emphasis to skills development than we have in the past. Next, next slide, please. Now, we know a lot about how to teach skills. I've mentioned already they have to be context specific. Sorry. We know that learners need lots of practice. Now, think about this. If you're trying to teach critical thinking, can you do that in one course, just your course you're teaching? No, it has to be done over the whole program. But then it needs to be related to what students have learned in previous courses and what they're going to learn in future courses. If you're going to make their critical thinking better, 
there should be some kind of progression in the teaching, in the teaching of critical thinking. And, and learners need lots of practice. And again, this is where the technology comes in helpful. My, my grandson was using the technology to practice problem solving in mathematics. We also need know that skills initially need small steps um, and regular feedback from an expert. And increasingly, that expert doesn't have to be an individual. It can be a piece of software, for instance. But the more complex the skill, the more you need a human expert and the less you can rely on the technology for that. So the feedback is something that's less easy as, uh, as you get to higher intellectual skills levels to automate. And as I said, it should be developed over a program rather than just one course. You should develop skills over a program. And this means be, being much more specific in identifying what skills you want to develop, how you're going to assess those skills, and in particular, what distinguishes between high level of skill competence and a relatively low level of skill competence in terms of intellectual skills. And that's a tricky one for a lot of instructors. Next slide, please. So the question then is, what are the teaching methods that best develop skills? Um, now, I've not got time to go into that, and, I, and it also depends on the subject discipline. But I would like to see a lot more discussion and focusing on what teaching methods are likely to develop skills. And some quick and easy answers are things like experiential learning, for instance, a focus on experiential learning, allowing students to do things and experience things and apply what they learn, for instance. And what role can technology play in developing and assessing skills? And particularly, what do we assess and how? I, I think what we're going to see eventually is the end of that kind of sit down paper and pencil exam system. I think that's going to go. What we'll start seeing is e-portfolios of students' work, which demonstrate not only what they know, but what they can do as well. Next slide, please. So here are some methods for developing um, skills development. Discussion, social learning for testing and developing ideas. Problem-based learning, experiential learning, learning by doing. Communities of practice where experienced people um, uh, share experience, so they fill in gaps in their knowledge. Community-based learning, which I mentioned is a specific form of skills development. And above all, knowledge management, getting students to find, apply, and manage uh, information. Uh, next slide, please. So what does this mean in terms of teaching approaches? Well, in general, I think it means a, a shift from information transmission to knowledge management, um, a focus on skills development integrated with content, um, but the focus is on the skills, more on the content. The content is a means to an end and not an end in itself. The end is skills development. Lecture-based courses replaced by student projects, problem-based learning, collaborative learning, and goodbye written exams replaced by e-portfolios demonstrating students' skills as well as their knowledge. Our next slide, please. <clears throat> so so uh, if you're teaching an advanced, what I would call an advanced online or blended course design, the focus will be on the core skill of knowledge management, how to find, analyze, evaluate, and apply information. It would be open content within a learning design. In other words, the students would go out, you would direct them, you would give them guidelines, but they are open to find content wherever they can on the internet, but within a learning design. In other words, you don't just send them off and say, here's a problem, solve it. You have a series of steps they can go through, you have guidelines, you have a set of criteria that, you're, that, that you teach up front before they go off and do these things. So there's a learning design but they are free to find whatever content they can um, uh, w w within the context of the course. Student-generated student multimedia content, you get the students to show what they've learned through developing multimedia. Um, students can make, say, YouTube videos or can make videos or, or, or um, posters, online posters, 
uh, of their of what they've learned. Uh, assessment by e-portfolios where the students provide examples of what they've done, often in multimedia formats. And I've got one example here of this kind of course from University of British Columbia. It's called Ventures in Learning Technology. This course is different every year. The students come in and they have to learn how to develop a business around learning technologies. And what the students are asked to do in the first week is to go and research new apps, new developments that they think might have an educational application. They don't have one at the moment, but it could be adapted and maybe used in education. Then they get what's called a boot camp where they go through some basic stuff in developing a business, such as a business plan, business planning, uh, budgeting, and so on. And they end the course with having to do a YouTube video pitch um, to a prospective investor. In, in three minutes, they have to deliver uh, an argument for why this technology has a future in education. Um, now, that's an indication of the kind of, uh, of course that I'm thinking that we need to be developing to, to develop knowledge, knowledge, um, uh, knowledge based industry learners, knowledge based learners for the future, where students are uh, involved in finding and creating materials, but they're working within a learning framework that sets criteria, sets standards um, and so on. But there's a lot of freedom for the students working within that kind of teaching design. And it's just one example. There are many possible examples here. Next slide, please. So the implications for, uh, for teaching and learning new faculty roles, teaching performance will be a major competitive advantage. If students can get knowledge from anywhere, why would they come to your institution? Can your institution offer something that will really help the students acquire the knowledge that they need. And I think teaching performance will become increasingly important to, to keep and maintain students. Instructors will need pedagogical knowledge and technology skills, as well as subject expertise. Uh, this will require pre-service and in-service training and a change in the tenure and promotion system to reward better, more effective teaching um, than, than we have at the moment, where most of the most of the rewards are for research. And incidentally, governments need to be concerned about this because we're talking here about uh, e economic development and economic competitiveness. If we're not getting the students with the skills required um, to develop um, knowledge-based industries, then the economy is going to suffer considerably. And sorry, can we go back? And lastly, learning technology support through instructional designers and media designers and teamwork, and increasingly online support for faculty who want to use new media for teaching. Uh, I'll give you one example here from the University of British Columbia. They have a very nice website. If you want to make a short video, a YouTube video, they, based on uh, research into what makes for effective educational video, um, they have a set of, of, of guidelines and so on that you can go in and apply simple things like don't make a video more than 20 minutes long and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, the digital economy requires high level intellectual skills. The teaching methods must include opportunities for skills development. Technology enables more flexible delivery and ways to practice skills but it all needs to be within a specifically designed learning environment that supports learners. Uh, next slide, please. So, some questions for you. Are you convinced of the need for change in your teaching? What is the most relevant of these developments for your teaching? And what are the main barriers you face in changing your teaching? So over to you now, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for... Big round of applause there, Tony. I hope you picked fine. Uh, okay, uh, before I ask for any questions in the room, while everyone's thinking on those questions, there is a question from the chat room from Irina White, uh, just to give us some thinking time. Tony, do you believe 
Oh, this is a good one. Tony, do you believe learning management systems are stifling the creativity of teaching online or enhancing it? And we uh, use good question. <laughs> or Moodle uses us. I'm not quite sure what it is. Okay, let me just say that I think of learning management systems as like a like like um, a piece of office equipment. It, it's like a filing cabinet. It's where you store stuff. It's a digital filing cabinet. So it's like saying, do you think a filing cabinet stifles innovative management? Um, I don't see the two as being necessarily linked. One of the things we found in the survey is that virtually every institution in Canada is using a learning management system, even those that are doing very innovative teaching. So it's there, it's a tool. And I, I think what, what stifles, stifles innovation is just following the same formula for using the learning management system as, we've, as, as in the past. That's what stifles it. Um, I think what stifles it more is maybe the old ADDI model, which restricts the way we think about designing online courses um, into a kind of linear process. I think we need more flexible methods of course design, uh, like that one I mentioned, where you design to some extent on the fly, but you're driven by good educational pedagogical principles. So I think that you know we have so much change happening now amongst our students, amongst the knowledge base and so on, that we have to have flexible methods of delivery. Now, does the learning management system limit that? Well. It depends how you use it. Um, if you want students to go there to find stuff, um, if you want to organize and structure your course, it's a very good tool for doing that. Um, but after that, there's no limit to what you can use. So what we're finding is that learning management systems are being used alongside social media, are used alongside um, uh, web conferencing and so on. It's not an either or question. Okay, thanks. Are there any questions or comments in the room? Does anyone want to respond to these three questions from Tony? While I'm giving you a chance to do that, I'll respond to the first one, whether we're convinced of the need for change in our teaching. I think at UniSA we are convinced. Um, the, the, the digital learning strategy we're operating under at the moment would indicate that we are convinced, and if we're not convinced, we better be convinced. <laughs> Uh, we're putting in, I don't know if you're aware, Tony, but we have Unis Online uh, launching early next year, which is a which is a suite of 12 online programs, 100% online. And just building on, on what you were saying before about the uh, use of video and multimedia, we're heavily invested in uh, developing video and multimedia. So that's definitely a path down which we're going and we're very, uh, we've become very reliant on online educational designers and media developers as well. So throughout your talk, there was lots of people nodding and agreeing. And and I, I take a lot of what you've said as, as confirmation that we're going down the right path as well. So thanks for that, Tony. Do you have anything you'd like to add on the use of video? Because that's something that's very, uh, very relevant to us here at UniSA. Is that a question to me? Yes, it is, just on the use of video. And then I've got another question after. Okay, um, okay, first comment, I think we grossly underuse video in post-secondary education. Um, now, you have to understand that my background is I started off by evaluating the television and radio programs that the BBC made for the Open University. And I was impressed by the um, power of, of, of the use of the video by the BBC, and in those days, it cost a huge amount of money to do it. We don't have to spend that that kind of money anymore. Uh, the technology is much cheaper, and we've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work. Um, but but video is very powerful means of teaching because it it's, it is a multimedia medium. It has audio and visuals, and it can incorporate things like animation and graphics as well. Um, but we have to use it not just for delivering teaching heads. That's not the best way to use video, talking heads. Um, 
And what I'm finding is that the best users of video are not the instructors, but the students. The students are much more able to go out and see how they can apply video to what they're learning often than the instructors are. So I think that's the other thing that's really changed about the use of technology is that now the, the, the end user, the students in our case, have very powerful tools that they can use to demonstrate their learning. And I think a very good way to use video is to get students to apply what you, see if they can apply what you're teaching them into real life contexts and, and then show, show how that works um, by recording and video, uh, making a video program about it. And again, don't be too ambitious about this, you know, keep it to three or five minutes, get them to demonstrate one point. But I, I think we could be using video a lot more than we are at the moment. Okay, on that note, uh, just to add some complexity um, to the use of video, um, some emerging research is showing that students that rely heavily on recorded lecture video um, compared to those who are relying more on the face-to-face -face lecture are becoming more surface learners as a result. Can you comment on that? Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's not, not my... I, I think it's a very bad way to use video. I mean, it, 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 it's a very unimaginative way of using video. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with a lecture as such, um, provided you, you realize what its limitations are and it has a specific purpose. I mean, this has been a lecture. It's an attempt to get over a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, but... And it would probably be better if it was done face to face than if it was done online. But if I was using video, I wouldn't use it for a lecture. I would use it for something else. Uh, thank you, Tony. That's a really, um, <clears throat> really insightful presentation. Something that concerns me, which I observe with both my internal and external students, is that there seems to be so much more anxiety and mental health issues um, amongst the students we're seeing. I don't really know why. Um, and I'm, I worry that with external students, it's harder to, to gauge that and offer them support. Do you have any sort of strategies you use for that? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I, I, I think it's really important that we keep the humanity in teaching, even if we are using a technological approach. Um, we know from fully online learning that students need a lot of support online. They, they, you can't just leave them on their own. Um, you know, I, I have um, nine steps to quality online learning, and one of them is communicate, communicate, communicate. Students need to feel the presence of the instructor, even if you're not there. And there are lots of ways of doing that without swamping you with work. But um, students need to know, for instance, that you're monitoring the online discussion, if there is an online discussion. Um, and there is a lot of anxiety about stu from students these days because of the pressures they're under. Um, certainly in Canada, people are worried about leaving university not only with a large debt, student debt, but also whether they'll get a job or not. And the kind of jobs that their parents used to have, you know, nine to five regular for the rest of your life, they're just going, we don't, you know, they're just going in Canada. In fact, teaching is one of the few areas where that kind of job still exists. So there are lots of reasons for their anxiety. Um, and I think we have to be very careful when we use technology that we don't add to that anxiety. I think we have to assure students that we're there for them, even if they are not physically present on campus all the time. Thanks very much, Tony. Okay, we have two questions and we'll be done, thanks. It's a bit uh, coming back to that uh, video, Tony. Uh, I think the video is, uh, I see, is a, a teaching tool um, like any other one. You know, if you overuse it, you can have a death of, of video like we have death of PowerPoint. Uh, and what sort of came clear as well during the year I've been involved with uh, online teaching and learning is um, a lot of people jump at video straight away and think it's a good idea. But have people thought about, in a lot, particular in assessment, if you have 15, 20 students or even more, to send you a video, you have to watch that 10 minutes or 15 minutes. You can't scan a video to get the whole content, the whole picture, where a written format you can scan and be going working through much faster. So that's a consideration you've got to think about it when you ask for video. 
um, submissions or anything like that. Thank you. Yeah, but again, it depends on whether you're doing uh, summative or formative assessments. Um, I, the, the way that the YouTube videos were used in that course I mentioned was quite interesting. That They would do a first draft, if you like, a, a preview version, and then they would share that with all the other students, and the students were given feedback. So, um, and then they would go and remake it on the basis of the student feedback, not the instructor's feedback. Um, and then the instructor just had to focus on assessing each of the individual final versions. And incidentally, there was a huge improvement between the first versions and the second versions in, on most, in most cases as a result of that student feedback. Now, again, this is a cultural issue. You have to get the students uh, to understand that working collaboratively is a skill and that's a very important skill that will be rewarded um, not only in their assessment, but when they go out in, to work in the real world. And if you don't have that collaborative environment in your class, then you're not going to be able to use peer review very well, for instance, because it's been found in business studies particularly that students hate peer review. Uh, they're very competitive. They want to be better than the other students and they don't want to help the other students. So, so it's a cultural issue as well. But, but I, I think, again, that there are ways to redesign your teaching so that you keep your own workload down as well as the students. I, I think it's a very important thing that as we add technology, it ought to replace something and not just be added on to all the other things that students have to do, like read regular textbooks and so on. Thanks, Sonny. Just a, a quick question. Um, I'm just interested, I'm in the process of shifting from the the typical lecture with the PowerPoint video. And I, I find it interesting that we, we think we're doing it better um, here with a green screen and a video. Uh, I think it's still the extension of PowerPoint. There's not much difference there. What I'm trying to move towards is that idea of media rich, which is more the television level of content where the, the person is out there in the profession showing the, the environment, but also facilitating the theory across has, have you seen much of that design where we're moving away from just lecture video to an actual, I don't know how, what the term is, it's more of that high-end TV level uh, video yeah, yeah. And research and what students are thinking of that platform? Well, I think one thing is not to think you have to do everything yourself in terms of producing a video. There, there is a lot of open education resources out there now in the form of video which are not a whole class, you know, they, they may be a five minute, but it may be a critical five minutes. For instance, if you're teaching statistics, uh, if you can bring in, it's, it's actually may not be a video, maybe an animation of a normal curve of distribution, uh, you don't have to do that, it's out there already. Then maybe you can build that into a video uh, that takes that and, and applies it more specifically to the area of teaching that you're concerned with. So there are a lot of examples of existing video out there now um, increasingly good quality uh, that you can integrate uh, or combine with your own video um, and so on. I'll give you another example. Um, uh, I, one of the pockets of innovation was a, 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 a veterinary sciences professor teaching um, anatomy and she only had she, one pl plastin, 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 plastinated model of a dog's heart they're expensive to make, and she had a class of 40 students. So what she did, she did very simply, she took her iPhone and she made a little video about, uh, around this plastinated model, uh, which students could then just download and look at in their leisure, rather than having just two or three minutes while it got handed around the class, for instance. Now, it took her a little, little bit of a, a while to get to know how to get the shots up and to handle the technical side. But with relatively little effort, she was able to produce quite good quality videos, which were much more effective than the students sort of all trying to pour over one model in, in a large class. So it, it's really finding the context in which the video will be very useful and making sure that you do it simply, but actually focus on the visuals as well as on, uh, on the words. Okay, thanks very much, Tony. I think we'll call it quits there. And I'd just like to once again thank you very much for uh, speaking with us.
I hope you hear the clapping, and we, we really appreciate your, your efforts. So thanks very much, Tony, and I'll be in touch with you soon. Thanks. Okay, bye.